Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Guitar Talk with Todd here at Todd BB Music. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, being with me today. Please hit that subscribe button in the lower right hand corner. You know I appreciate it. Help me get my subscribers up here. I appreciate you guys, each and every one of you being on board with me here. Uh, we always have guitar reviews, which is what we're going to do today. Artist interviews, product reviews, lessons, all kinds of stuff going on. So we appreciate you guys being with us. We are powered by Death Wish Coffee, Valhalla Java. So grab a cup and drink up and join us. <laughs> Mm. We always love our Death Wish. I uh, even got my Death Wish coffee sweatshirt on today. But uh, anyways, today we're going to get in the time machine and go back to 1988. Um, it was the uh, age of big hair, big guitar, big, big, big everything. Everything was over-processed, over-loud, over just. Um, the age of excess there in the 80s. So 1988, uh, the Heritage Guitar Company. We've had many Heritage on here before on this show. Do a search on my channel. We've had many H140, 150, 157, 535, uh, many even rare models. So check those all out. We love our Heritage guitars here. But Heritage opened up in Kalamazoo, Michigan in 1985 right in the middle of the 80s, and um, they were already giving us great stuff like the H140 and what we traditionally know as, as their body styles and whatnot, but if you were a guitar company in 1988, it was a weird time because <laughs> uh, guitars that looked like this are even more excessive with everything pointy and bright colors and super strats, which is what this is, Floyd Rose, whammy bars, high performance pickups, that was all the rage. So it's funny, this is not traditionally something you would see me with. Uh, someone commented earlier when I was saying that it looks very strange <laughs> having me standing here with a with a super strap, but it's, it's fun playing this. I'm having a good time playing this guitar, I like it. Um, this is not the only thing that Heritage dabbled in in the 80s. I know they had the Stat, not the Strat, the Stat, S-T-A-T, that they, you know, put out as kind of a, a hint that it was more like a Strat type of thing, and it was a Super Strat. So they definitely jumped on that wagon, and I, you kind of had to. If you were a guitar manufacturer in the 1980s, that was what was selling, and... Um, you know, stuff that Heritage was putting out, like the H140 and all that. At that time, more traditional guitar players, which at that time were older guys, were what were buying that stuff. And to hit the younger market, they needed to have this kind of stuff going on. And they did. So kudos to them. And it was made very well, too. So putting out a traditional Gibson-style guitar, which ultimately is what Heritage was doing because... Uh, we've talked about this many times on this show, but just real quick, the Heritage Guitar Company was formed by former Gibson employees when Gibson moved to Nashville. A few of the guys stayed behind, and they formed Heritage there in 1985, so they were the guys that built a lot of those classic Gibson models that are uh, highly sought after. You know, those guys went back into the 50s for you know as long as they had worked at Gibson. So they, they were the guys making that stuff. And that type of style of guitar was pretty, uh, you know, in 2023 when this is being recorded, those are very popular. Right now they've come back. Everybody wants the vintage stuff and all that. 1988, not so much. <laughs> so even though they were putting those out and giving us those classic style guitars that they were, were used to building and did an extremely well job with, I think they felt like they needed to hop on the wagon and get some stuff out. Everyone was doing it. This was what was popular at that time. So they needed to come up with a super strat. And um, 
This is the Heritage H162. Uh, I'm going to put this in, I guess, the unicorn uh, model. It's not super, super rare, but they don't pop up very much. So, uh, you know, we do, we will have the unicorn run across the screen here at some point, like we always do <laughs> on our unicorn episodes. But uh, this was made by Heritage right there in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And like we said, it is what you would call a super strat. And um, this is a testimony to the work those guys could do there in Kalamazoo. Because like I just said, they were used to making those class classic Gibson style models of the day. That was what they perfected when they worked at Gibson. And uh, this is just completely on the other end of the spectrum. And... Um, I would put this up against anything as far as a super strat goes. This is not my guitar of choice usually, but um, you know we are going to feature this on the guitar on the channel today. A private owner brought this in to have me do a setup on it, and it is a heritage. And I was like, man, I got to feature this because it's it's heritage history. They did make these, but um, like I said, I would put this up against anything. It's got the traditional pointy headstock that you would expect on an 80s model uh grover tuners up here the heritage silk screened on uh interesting we've got the bell-shaped truss rod cover again this is a 1988 uh early 90s gibson and heritage got into a whole thing in court and one of the outcomes of that was that Heritage could not use the bell-shaped truss rod cover anymore. That is strictly Gibson, so you won't see these on any Heritage models anymore. They use the type of truss rod cover that they use now that you'll see even to this day on their models. But in 1988, they were still using the bell-shaped one right here. This has the locking nut on it which is what you would normally have with a floyd rose type of a thing this is actually a kaler and um we actually don't even have these tightened right now so i mean really you could just take them off but this guitar stays in tune extremely well so we haven't even found a need to lock that down or use it right now it just makes it a lot faster to tune obviously uh dot inlays maple neck maple fingerboard so that's totally different too i mean usually Again, with Heritage stuff, you're used to ebony, rosewood, like your classic woods that you would associate with Heritage or Gibson. Not on this. We had the maple neck and maple fingerboard. Um, let's look at the body here. Mahogany body. Some really cool stuff going on. This is the Kaler Spider system is what this is called. It's pretty much identical to a Floyd Rose. Um, the owner does not have the whammy bar <laughs> and didn't even so we won't be doing any dive bombs or anything today but you could on this if you wanted to uh, i set it up non-floating which is how they wanted it uh, they actually told me set it up the way i would want it and um basically this is just flat against the body and it just kind of sits there we're not doing any dive bombs or anything like that but like i said you certainly could adjust this and you could it's got the fine tuners on here for me that's always kind of gotten a little bit in the way whenever i do like uh, faster stuff like that and i kind of am right down with my palm i'm totally slamming into that um so what i always do you could just remove these um, I just screw them all the way down so they're not sticking up at all. And I, like we just said a couple minutes ago, I just unlock the tuners, uh, the nuts up here rather. The locking nut, I don't know what I'm saying, and release it so that you can just tune it like you you know would with a standard guitar. Uh, as far as pickups here, these are shallower pickups, which is real popular with Heritage during that era. Again, this is 1988. Uh, I've got a single coil, a single coil, and a humbucker, which is awesome because this also has the coil tap switch. So for that particular uh, pickup, that humbucker, if it's, you can actually hear that if I turn it up. If it's down, that's humbucker, so it's a little bit quieter the minute I flip this up. You can hear it goes into single coil. Um, so that's kind of a really cool feature, gave you a lot more, you know, tonal options than just a Strat or something like that. Five-way 
selector switch, uh, volume control, and tone control. Pretty straightforward there. And we got the classic white finish going on here. Um, this is a really cool guitar. Again, it's not really what I go for usually. <laughs> uh, I don't, uh, you know, play these ever really but um i'll be honest with you the last couple days i've been playing this a lot uh setting it up and whatnot and just getting used to it it's a cool guitar um it's really weird how that whole thing you know like i said the 80s pointy guitars like this and whatnot and les pauls and all that kind of stuff were dead in the water and right around the time this was being made uh you know guns and roses was coming out appetite for destruction and I think that along with, uh, there was a lot of things, obviously the grunge movement that came in in the early 90s. And then um, unfortunately, I think even things like Stevie Ray Vaughan's death in 1990 brought a lot of attention to blues and music like that. And it just, all that stuff colliding at once pretty much just destroyed this and brought back all that classic stuff the last paul and all that stuff that's still going strong today and um and that's an awesome thing that the public was kind of reawakened to how great that stuff um is but um there was a lot of cool guitars made during that time again this is not something i would ever play for a couple of reasons um one being i'm not a big fan of three pickup guitars even a strat I just don't, when I pick, I tend to pick right where that middle pickup is, and I, I'm also a deep picker, so I go pretty far under the strings when I'm picking, and um, man, I'm just slamming into that thing all the time. It's like, get this thing out of the way. <laughs> so I, I'm not really a big fan of three pickup guitars. Um, you know, obviously I can play them. I can play on anything if I have to. But if you're asking me for a preference, no, I, I'm not a big fan of three pickup guitars. So what I tend to do with something like this is kind of, you know, work in here the best I can and right in this area between these two pickups is kind of where I'm going to be as far as like, you know, picking and whatnot. <laughs> But that's even right cool right there, a great example of if I'm down, or let's do a great example of rather, if I'm down, again, this is humbucker. Okay, and now I've gone into single coil. to humbucker so you can hear the single coil has a little bit more bite to it in my opinion um i remember mike bloomfield saying that in an interview once that like with a p90 you get so much great you know tonal and you do with humbuckers too but he even said you tend to lose a little bit of that i think he called it honk <laughs> when you go to a humbucker and I, I completely agree um but it's it's a whole different kind of a thing um but this is very cool you've got that option there only with this pickup so in other words trying to get this all on the camera here if i'm say on the neck pickup only which is traditionally deeper anyway this switch doesn't do anything uh, it only affects the, the uh, bridge pickup here, which is a humbucker, and then you can turn it into single coil um, if you want to. Very cool guitar. Um, like I said, one volume, one tone. I kind of got off topic there a little bit. That's the other thing I've never been a big fan of, um, even with a Strat or something like that, is um, the one volume. I'm a huge fan of like a Heritage Gibson style setup where you've got two tone, two volume. Not even the tone so much. 
I can really work with one tone control, but I love having two volume controls, one for each, you know, pickup, because I use that as, like, you can use it as a kill switch. Um, you know, you can kind of keep your one pickup a lot lower and keep it traditionally, you know, more for, like, rhythm and whatnot, and then keep that other one full on. I would say it's the four-wheel drive switch, and then the minute you go into the lead, just hit that switch, and you're full on, whereas here, you got to keep fooling with the volume knob unless you're using like a volume pedal or something i'm not really a huge pedal guy either i kind of traditionally just plug in and go um i use like a cry baby. as far as electric goes i use a cry baby um you know once on some stuff and whatnot which truly really sounds cool but i don't use any volume pedals or anything like that i like to work all that right off the guitar so just having one volume Again, I can use it and work with it if I absolutely have to, but as far as, like, I'm going to play a show, I want exactly what I want. I'm not going to bring a guitar <laughs> like this because it's just got too many the pickups in the way, one volume, uh, you know, pretty much pointless um, Kaler whammy bar system here that doesn't need to be on there because I'm not a big whammy bar guy either, never have been. And, uh, and this just gets in the way. So there's just a lot of stuff here that did, that is just hard to kind of work with for me. But that being said, there's a lot of stuff here that's great. And it's a piece of heritage history. And it's kind of weird because, um, you know, a lot of those guitars that were popular, you know, Ibanez, which is still popular, Jackson, Charvel, Kramer, um, you know, that whole era there. All very well-made guitars, by the way. Again, I'm just saying whatever, for me, what I prefer, what I, they're, they're all very well-made. Um, you know, I'm not putting anybody down that uses a whammy bar either. There's guys that do it way better than me. That's one of the right reasons I don't. But, <laughs> but um, it, it's weird. This feels like a heritage. I know that sounds strange, but even though, it, I mean, I've played the Kramers and all those 80s guitars, there's something about this one. It still has that heritage feel to it, even though it's, you know, looking at this from a distance or whatever, you would not say this is a heritage. You'd probably say, oh, it's a Kramer or an Ibanez or something like that does not look like a heritage guitar. So they quit making these many, many years ago. And, um, you know, they, I know they did several colors. I've seen a red one and I'm pretty sure they did blue and um, various other things, a couple other different colors. So I think black and obviously white. <laughs> But uh, as far as, like I said, tones go, um, you know, up here we're on the neck pickup, nice and bassy. go to like the combination of the middle and the neck obviously the tone knob affects everything Some of these, even like the pickup I'm on, pickups rather, or if I go back to strictly the neck pickup and crank this up, you can get a really nice, you know, bluesy. <laughs> Thank you. 
it's you know it's a really cool obviously full on down um bridge pickup like we just talked about as far as brock stuff goes i mean this is a super strat so we're in full you know full on mode here As far as our tones go, we can get pretty bright here. <laughs> so that's all humbucker going to single coil. <laughs> Like we said, I'm full on right here with the tone if I roll that back. Yeah, so it's a really, really, really cool guitar. Um, like I said, for me, uh, playing, you know, Gibson heritage style guitars all the time, obviously we've featured quite a few of them on this show and we will continue to do so because we love them. <laughs> but, um, for me, switching gears for a little bit and playing something like this is pretty cool because it's so opposite end of the spectrum. It's kind of like, wow, this is kind of neat to, to play on this. Uh, I'm not a shredder guy, uh, you know, I'm obviously, if you know me from watching this channel or just know me personally, um, definitely more of a blues-based guy, I always have been, but, um, it, you know, it's kind of fun to play one of these, like I said, because it's on the opposite end of the spectrum, so, uh, but anyway, let's go ahead and get some close-ups here in the case and check out this beautiful Heritage H162, here we go. Okay, so here is the case for the 1988 Heritage H162. Definitely period correct. They were using these long cases like this with the classic The Heritage on the front of them. This one's in actually very good shape, as is the guitar for its age. Let's open it up here. Again, everything is 1988 on this, so... Uh, this guitar is in fantastic condition, and so is the case. Um, Heritage was doing some things. But here's the compartment right here in the front, and they were also doing this type of thing at that time where you had, like, the little strap with the Velcro over here, and you could strap in the neck. Um, that was really big there in the late 80s, early 90s with Heritage. Uh, all right, so let's get some close-ups of this thing. Like I said, we got the classic white going on here. Um, if you really get in the light, you can see there is like some finish checking. I'm going to try to get some better shots of that in a second. Um, you can see it a little bit, but, um, you know, as expected <laughs> for 1988, this thing's been around a little bit, but I see, again, it's in fantastic shape. Uh, looking at these pickups here, again, we have single coil, shaller, another single coil, shaller, and then there's that humbucker that, again, can be transitioned into single coil mode here with the flip of the switch and the coil tap over here, volume, tone, and the five-way selector, uh, pretty standard stuff there on a super strat, which, again, is what we're going for, mahogany body. Uh, on this one and there's that beautiful maple neck with those dot fingerboard markers um fantastic condition on this too the frets are in great shape all original this hasn't seen a whole lot of play time so it's a great example of this 
from that era. That's uh, you'll see some of these come up once in a while, and they're pretty, you know, beat up. But um, this one's in great shape. Um, I got the locking nut going on here again. These are just loose you can pretty much loosen and tighten them right now with by finger obviously you would use an allen wrench if you're going to tighten those down but um i set this up the way i would do it which is what the owner wanted where i just leave these loose and then um you know tune it like you traditionally would some guys in case you don't know would lock that down good with an allen wrench it really helps with keeping it in tune and then you can fine tune down here when you need to if you're using a whammy bar and everything this obviously doesn't even have the whammy bar on it and the owner's not really too worried about it and i agree it plays very well like this if you're not looking to do dive bombs and all that kind of stuff but if you are you could very easily turn this into back into the way it should be instead of non-floating which is how it is now it's just you know going straight there um okay getting back up here to the headstock we have the heritage silkscreen logo with these grover tuners up here uh, we talked about this a bit earlier the bell-shaped truss rod cover that is original and that was a thing that uh gibson sued heritage in the early 90s for a lot of copyright infringement and whatnot. And one of the outcomes of that lawsuit was that Heritage had to change their truss rod cover shape, uh, even to this day in 2023, which is when this is being recorded. Gibson is the only guitar manufacturer that has the rights to use the bell-shaped truss rod cover like that. So you'll see that on all Gibsons, but Heritage had to quit using that. Um, I believe it was around 1991. They went to what you see now with their, you know, uh, truss rod covers that have been on them for years. But again, this is a 1988, so that did have it. All right, let's get a shot of the back here one time. Okay, so... Traditional stuff that you would expect on a Super Strat. I'm trying to focus here. Get the bolt on neck. I probably should have mentioned that earlier, but as would be expected with <laughs> with a Super Strat, that was all the rage in the '80s. And I mean, of course, you know, on a Fender Stratocaster or something like that. That's how that is, even to this day. Uh, there is a great example of some checking going on right there that you can see. Uh, there's your cavity to get into the tone and volume controls and that coil tap switch. That is the plate to get into the tremolo. Uh, again, that's a Kaler Spider system. I'm going to flip back over and look at that again one time before we're done. So if you're not really using it, like we're not on this one and the owner isn't, you never really need to have that plate off. Um, you know, you can adjust the spring tension and all that stuff in there. But if you're not really using it, you don't really need to worry about that at all. Uh, beautiful shot of the maple neck there. Um, we've got Dunlop style strap locks on here. But again, I am always powered by strap tight. Uh, and as is the owner that I turned on to strap tight. <laughs> so basically, they're just going to throw the strap on, throw a strap tight over there, good to go. But again, you could use traditional Dunlop locks too if you wanted to. Let's get a shot of the side here and the output jack. Okay, so again, very popular for that era. They had the recessed jack that was kind of right into the body like that um, without the plates or anything like that that they ultimately, you know, went to later on. But that was very, very common for Heritage and their output jacks at that time, which again is 1988. Okay, so again, looking at this tremolo system, this is what they call a Kaler Spider system and it's pretty much identical to a floyd rose um you know if you were going to use it you uh you know everything loosens up tension wise back here uh intonation is all done with these screws you basically cut the ball end off and just the tip of the string pops in there and then you tighten this back up 
And again, you could use fine tuners and all that if you wanted to, but I talked about that earlier in the video. I pretty much always just screw these flat down as low as they can go, and then this is what would be called non-floating. It's just straight and being used as a traditional style bridge, but it could be very, very easily converted into what it's meant to do if you want it to go that way. You just need to get the stick, which is easy to find, and uh, you could turn this right back to a full-on 80s shred machine if you so desired. But uh, there's one more full shot in the case. Uh, great piece of history here and a pretty rare guitar for the Heritage Company, the H162. All right, guys, so there she is in the case. Let's uh, take her for a test drive here. I'm going to play um, just some rock stuff. This is 1988, baby. <laughs> we might as well do as much rock stuff as we can here. And, um, and it's not going to be any full-on shredding going on, but I'm going to kind of borderline on that type of stuff while keeping it somewhat bluesy if I can, too, just to kind of show what this guitar can do and what it's kind of capable of that people might not expect it to be able to do. Um, I'm going to do some slide, which I always do. Uh, wow, did anyone in the 80s use one of these to play slide on? I don't know. But uh, I'm going to do, surprisingly, this, um, I was playing around with this earlier with some slide. This is great for playing slide on it. It, it works very well. I'm babbling on and on here, but let's check her out and see what she sounds like, the Heritage H162. Check her out. <laughs>
right, guys, so there she is, the Heritage H162 in the classic white here, the Super Strat from the guys in Kalamazoo, Michigan at Heritage Guitar. Uh, like I said, Heritage is still going strong today. They're under a little bit new ownership as of 2023, but uh, this is from 1988, the early years of the company, and uh, it's just a really, really cool instrument. You will see these pop up on the you know used market once in a while, and um, you know grab one if you can. It's a cool piece of heritage history, and um, you know very well made. You get that awesome heritage quality that you always get from those guys. And like I was saying earlier, it's weird. It's a super strat. It's a pointy guitar. It's a shred machine. A high perform. Everything's you know decked out here for the 80s but at the same time it still has a heritage feel to it made in the usa right there in kalamazoo and um those guys always did excellent craftsmanship and like i was also saying they excelled in the what you know as the gibson line because they were some of the guys that originally created that stuff from working at gibson um so for them to be so awesome at creating something like this just shows what kind of craftsmen that they were because this is a completely different beast for them to be building and like i said i would put this up against any shred machine that came out of the 1980s but uh go ahead and comment you guys please let me know what you think do you have a super strat uh do you, are you fans of them uh, ibanez kramer all that stuff uh, go ahead and comment below. Let me know if you played one of these, an H162. I know, um, you know, like I said, Heritage also had the stat that was that they put out during that era. So, you know, comment on all this stuff. Let me know what you guys think. Uh, please hit that subscribe button in the lower right-hand corner. You know I appreciate it. And uh, thanks so much for being with us, you guys. It really means a lot to me. We will see you guys again. Stay safe and love your dogs. Take care.